our contemporaries, and also our forebears. Reading continues to feed writing always. Writers set the bar for their own work through what they read, through that particular combination of admiration and a mostly genial variety of something like envy that rises to the fore when we encounter something that's particularly fine. The sentence or the phrase, the paragraph, the page, the book, where we might say, oh my Lord, I wish I'd written that. <laughs> Everything we write rides astride the broad back of what was written before. For the great and growing body of work that makes our own work possible, we should feel gratitude above all. And gratitude is also what we properly feel for the success of everyone whose talent, whose skills, whose hard work and industry have brought them here tonight as nominees. My connections to this business are pretty occasional and pretty marginal, but I have been around long enough now to say with some certainty that while writers are hardly exempt from qualities of self-interest, I, I, I don't really think that anyone here is, um, has got canonization in their crosshairs anytime soon. <laughs> I have never known a group that demonstrates so consistently and across the board the support and the congeniality that writers accord one another. And why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we want anything other than the chance for everyone to do his or her own best work and for that work to be acknowledged? So, this is your night. And I, I hope, more than anything, I hope that you enjoy it deeply and I hope that you remember it for a long time. Two small things happened to me in this past week, and I don't think that I would have paid either any mind, except that they happened on the same day within an hour or so of each other. Ahead of me, in line, at a greengrocer's, was a woman who was loading her cabbages and parsnips into her Duffy's book bag. <laughs> and I thought, oh my god, look at that, there is an artifact. <laughs> and later, at home, wanting something to read, I, I went to the bookcase and just pulled up something that I uh, passed by many, many times, just never gotten around to, uh, Maiden Voyage by Dan Welsh. And the sales slip was still inside. I bought it at the Granville Book Company on June the 14th in the year 2000. <laughs> the grand old book company late and lamented and, and uh, yeah, I loved Duffy's and I loved the grand old book company and I, I, I loved Manhattan books and I loved Cedar books and I loved Octopus books and I loved women and, and on and on and with those two things with the grand old book company and with Duffy's in mind I, I, I allowed myself a sort of um, moment of horrible indulgence and out of regret you know of of what was gone. And then I, I pulled myself up short because I started to think about everything that is still here. About the bookstores that are still with us, that are prospering, about the new ones that are coming on stream, run by smart, young, committed people. I think about the communications that I occasionally have with my own publisher, always with people in their 20s and early 30s who are you know, smart and Committed to the, committed to publishing and committed to making writing known, and uh, you know it's it's a perilous thing, nostalgia. It's sort of like cigarettes and gin. It's, it's, it's a, a, addictive, but just not a good place to go. <laughs> because it, it, you get to that point where you start saying, "Yeah, and what about the CDC? <laughs> what about video management? No, wait, what about all of Fourth Avenue? What about?" A sunshine breakfast! <laughs> <clears throat> By the time I decided that I was really going to become a writer in the late 1940s, there was no creative writing department in our single BC university. There were no writers' groups. 
no one organizing writers' workshops or writers' festivals, and the only publishers were in some place called Toronto, <laughs> what we don't talk about. <laughs> but then this remarkable thing started to happen in BC. All this vibrance, vibrancy that came out of developing publishing companies and creative writing departments. And so that we ended up a few decades later with one of the most vibrant publishing writing industries and scenes in the whole of Canada and then beyond the borders. somebody standing on the other side of it and then they make the smelly face when it's a bad sentence, right? And you're like, okay. Um, so Lynn Henry is one of my two people. She stands on the other side of my sentence and makes the smelly face or kind of goes, yeah, keep going. And the other person um, has always been Jack Hodgins. And, uh, and so I want to thank Jack because I don't think I would have been here uh, without him, without his guidance and his own marvelous example as both writer and a human being. Um, I want to thank my amazing husband, Glenn, uh, this book took 12 years to write, uh, and they were not an easy 12 years. I was not charming every day. Uh, <laughs> most days, no, very few days. Um, it was an annihilating process, and I don't mean to oversell it, but you know, it was, it was, <laughs> it was not easy. And he never once, this is the thing, he never once said, maybe you should take more teaching courses, or maybe you should get you know, a different kind of work. He just said, go sit your ass back down at that desk and keep going. So I thank him for that. I thank my mother for never uh, undervaluing the idea of being a writer. That was as good to her as being a vet or as being prime minister. Those were my options. You're all in good hands. Oh, well, maybe not. Maybe I, anyway. Sorry. Um, and then lastly, I just I guess I want to say that um, this is a book about affection. This is a book that talks about how in the end of our days, maybe what we have when we have nothing else is the memory of affection and the feel of affection. Affection for each other, affection for our work, affection for things, right? Our time on this earth can be fleeting. Love where you can. Thank you. This is the Sky Train here, past Poplar Island, which is the reason for this book, a study of concentration for two years. And, um, and ultimately, yeah, this is um, with love for the land. Um, thank you. I wasn't sure why I called my book Rat of Ears. It's a story about a teen's struggles arising from sexual abuse. But the name stuck, and no one tried to make me change it. I was sure that I wasn't going to be allowed to keep the name. It's so strange. Nobody ever said, you can't have that name. Um, then, I was showing a video to a class of my sister, Sarah, who gave an interview to CBC television in 1993. She was uh, addicted to heroin, and she was um, talking to them about how people shouldn't do heroin. And I was watching the video, which I had seen many times before, and all of a sudden, I noticed two little points on Sarah. and. I realized that she had a Playboy bunny tattooed on her chest. Rabbit ears. Um, so much of my writing, including this book, arises from the horrors in my sister's life and in her death. I'm learning to listen, to pay close attention, but Sarah is not here for me to listen to. Sarah was a writer and an artist. What, I wonder, might she have taught me? What might she have taught all of us had she lived? Thank you. And I wanted to uh, first acknowledge that our story took place on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Kwa 
Kotbu um, Mikmak First Nation. And I wanted to um, yeah, thank our Dolphins community. So Slavia and uh, Roy, um, Carol, of course, Michael, <laughs> and Elisa. Um, we really were a community uh, putting this book together. And I also want to thank my um, sometimes art director, my son. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Slavia and I never wrote a children's book before, and we had never collaborated on anything so deeply before. We brought up two kids who were fairly well, well off. <laughs> we also went through over 40 years of conflicts and things with the world, and we've been involved in lots of projects over the years and so on. But coming to collaborate on a book was something else. <laughs> I, I worked late into the night, Slavia worked early, early morning on, and we used to pass this manuscript back and forth. Roy has written several books, but I have never published anything ever, and yet here I am. I mean, what's up with that? Honestly, I'm not really sure I know whose life I'm living, but thank you, Mike. Well, well, well. <laughs> A scientist winning a book prize. Right? <laughs> but I think it's the first time any book has been written about a marine ecosystem anywhere in the world. Um, the, the intent again was that we wanted British Columbians to understand the complexity. And I, when I'm asked to talk about the book, I'm sure that some of you have read that book by Richard Feynman, which uh, Sure, you're joking, Mr. Feynman, I think was the title. And in there, he writes that honesty in science is telling intelligent people what they need to know to make an intelligent decision. And that's what we tried to do with this book, is that we, we wanted to provide British Columbians with the information that they need to make good decisions about the future of the Strait of Georgia. So. And to the booksellers of BC, who I know I went into a lot of bookstores. I, 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 I go into a lot of bookstores anyways, but I actually went in kind of to see if a book was there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I, you know, it, it got a lot of prominence. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure for us to thank, thank you all for, for uh, making this work. Thank you. Um, wow, I'm as shocked as anyone that Howie White is not standing here. <laughs> uh, I salute you, Howie. I salute you, Robert McCulloch. Um, I'm very honored to accept this award with Aaron, uh, an award named for Bill Duffy, a legendary bookseller. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like to thank um, the booksellers of BC. I thank you for your passion and your perseverance. Uh, we need you and we need more of you. Um, I have a special uh, tip of the hat uh, I wanted to say to Drew Burns, who was the proprietor of the Commodore, um, who very graciously uh, uh, said that I should be the one to do the book one day when I bumped into him in a, in a coffee shop. And he felt sort of, I was being knighted to do, by him to do the book. And, uh, and sadly, he passed away before the, before the book came out, so I hope somehow he's smiling down on this whole affair with the rum and coke. Uh, watching us tonight, as would uh, a mentor of mine by the name of Chuck Davis, who was a winner in this category, um, who I uh, spent a lot of time with uh, in his in his sort of final years and whatnot, and uh, uh, I hope he him and, him and Drew are together. Let me have a laugh at all this. Um, thank you to the uh, to all the um, all the bookstores in the province that really received the book so warmly, and. Um, were so nice when I would come in to the stores. I used to get, I worked as a musician for many years, I used to get recognized in, in record stores and whatnot. Now I get recognized in bookstores. It's kind of a nice, happy thing to sort of graduate to or something like that. <laughs> so, I think more than anything, what makes me feel happy and optimistic about being here is just that. That it's easy to look at the the changes that have come on writing and publishing and bookselling, and Lord knows there have been lots of them, and they've been 
tricky waters to navigate. But on it goes, on it sails, gloriously. Here's the evidence gathered here tonight. So for all your good words and for all your good work, for everything that's to come, for the next 31 years, and it's, I, I, I can't think of the last time I did this, probably about 15 years ago, 15, I'll be 75. If I still have my own teeth, I want to come back for you. <laughs> um, and, 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 uh, and you know, it will go on. It will go on. It, it, it has to go on because this is what we do. This is how we practice being human. So again, congratulations to all of you. Congratulations.